Hi everybody, my name is Harold Jimenez and I am VP of R&D for the infrastructure product line here at HashiCorp. Super excited to be here. Uh, we're gonna start with the journey, the path to infrastructure automation and just share a little bit of my story around this. I used to run a server under my desk, like many of us did, and we we're just trying to figure things out. But this is really not a fun experience uh, to maintain this thing. Uh, then came the co-location uh, uh, trend of the early 2000s where um, you know, let's get a little more serious. Let's buy an actual server and rent a rack and configure all that stuff. And at the time we were also saying, okay, new beautiful server, uh, how do we maximize our throughput on this thing? And, you know, uh, look at, you know, partitioning kind of all these cores that are sitting here now idle. So we're looking at virtualization. And so virtualization was a very early but promising trend. Uh, where there were all sorts of vendors and open source projects uh, that uh, were trying virtualization at different levels and virtualizing different aspects of the entire stack, right, at the, at the very kind of low level of, 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 uh, of you know, machine hardware. And uh, we were all trying to do different things to kind of figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't. Uh, so this is a very tactical kind of uh, approach, uh, just kind of, trying things and sharing things out and, and improving over that. And then came the cloud, which said, hey, I'm, we're figuring out this whole virtualization thing. I'm gonna provide you with an API, just provision some resources, we'll give them to you, we'll manage it, we'll keep it up and healthy, uh, don't worry about it. And this was a great thing for a lot of us, right? Um, because all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, the bottom half of, all of my job just went away into, you know, we're, we can we can actually embrace this cloud uh, uh, environment. But the new thing was like, how do we actually migrate them? How do we migrate these systems over to cloud? There was a lot of folks just saying, you know, we're going to lift and shift and it's going to be the same, but we can run in cloud environments. Others were rewriting. Others were, you know, f just figuring it out. So it's a very tactical, manual, ad hoc thing. Um, and the shift from main mainframe uh, to dynamic infrastructure took years, but ultimately we're to the point where we embrace public cloud and now we're in this world of multi-cloud where we have uh, most organizations inevitably adopting multi-cloud strategy, whether it's hybrid and multi-cloud uh, to adopt, you know, different pieces where, you know, we play to the strengths of different cloud providers and ultimately, uh, you know, live in this world of, of a hybrid environment. So, but by doing this tactical um, uh, cloud adoption, we created a bunch of problems. <laughs> um, some of these stats are, are indicative of that. 21% of, of companies out there have had some kind of security event due to non-sanctioned IT. And so the idea that, you know, in a large organization, you have all sorts of people uh, provisioning cloud services, that's amazing on the one hand and the other, you know, it leads to issues with configuration or issues with abandoned hardware or abandoned resources and that kind of thing. And that, that leads to eventually some kind of security event. Similarly, you have 65% of cloud security issues start with a misconfiguration. So the, the, the nature of this, the workflow for provisioning is still manual and oftentimes ad hoc, uh, which leads to misconfiguration. And ultimately that leads to security issues, right? And then finally, we have 30% of overspending with minimal cloud cost optimization strategy. This kind of all ties together into the fact that like, we are just provisioning infrastructure in a very manual ad hoc way uh, and just over, overspent over provisioning. And so there's very little visibility, insight, control, governance over that in today. So, However, the, you know, we've gone a long way. The way to provision infrastructure has changed and it's changed for the better. Uh, we've, want, we've gone from the early days of dedicated servers. These are long lasting, long lived servers. I, I, I remember being uh, um, so proud of typing uptime into these servers and, and watching how long this has been running uh, to more capacity on demand, where I think of this as just a light bulb. You know, a light bulb is on, it's a commodity. If it burns, you, you replace it. You, it's as simple as that. And the same thing happens with infrastructure resources these days. Very easy to to replace, um, and we kind of embrace that, right? And so these are short-lived. We talk about immutable. We're not going in and touching them and reconfiguring them. We're just replacing them because cloud environments allow us to do that, right? And so enter the cloud operating model. How do we deal with these problems? And really the cloud operating model is trying to standardize in many of these uh, aspects um, that we just discussed and 
driving what we're calling the industrialized cloud adoption as opposed to tactical cloud adoption. And the basis of this is one, we have a golden workflow where um, all provisioning of infrastructure goes through the same workflow. It's well governed, it's uh, well understood uh, and allows us to share practices and allows uh, security vendors to, and security teams within organizations to, to have some level of control over over what goes out. Uh, and so we'll talk a lot about, uh, about that, but it directly addresses some of the issues, security issues that we were just talking about. Secondly, we have an extensible system and we'll talk about extensibility as well. Um, but here the idea is that we're meeting uh, our practitioners, you know, where they need to be. So there's a ton of providers on our cloud, our cloud infrastructure uh, tooling. So whatever cloud provider you want to use, whatever has an API, we can integrate with that. And as you'll see, we have uh, extensive ecosystem uh, penetration due to the extensible system that we've built. And then finally, there's the lifecycle management, which is really talking about um, once you provision, one point you provision, uh, we also e eventually update or deprovision, but there's a lot that happens in between. And that's the life cycle of these resources that we want to also think about as we uh, embrace the operating model. So the cloud operating model, to summarize, really drives infrastructure agility. It's much easier, faster to do the right thing and thus, you know, democratizing the whole process and allowing more and more people to do the right, to, to provision and own their own infrastructure and self-serve that. And also it drives infrastructure security because while we're allowing the scalability of infrastructure provisioning through the self-serve model, we're also having the right checks and balances in place and the right guardrails in place to make this you know, safe. So let's talk a little bit about the golden workflow. At the essence of the golden workflow, we have what we call infrastructure as code. <clears throat> and so infrastructure as code is a strategy of, of capturing complexity of infrastructure provisioning by borrowing tools and practices from software engineering, software development. Um, so to give you just a little bit of an idea of what that looks like, uh, we'll have a, um, a partitioner on the bottom left writing infrastructure as code uh, using through the registry community, community providers or modules, uh, which allow them to integrate with cloud services um, and essentially defining what that infrastructure should look like, declaring that. So we say that it's declarative for the most part. And then our, our, the Terraform uh, uh, core engine is gonna run a plan. And this plan is gonna say, okay, based on the current state of the world out in the infrastructure and what you want that infrastructure to be, here are the changes that are going to make. So this is something that a, a user can evaluate. It's human readable and easy to kind of consume. And then once after that, we can say, okay, apply this plan. And that infrastructure will eventually land in that consistent state uh, that was declared by the infrastructure as code. And this code is actually quite easy to, to reason about. Uh, there's this language called HCL and allows you to uh, declare these, these resources and uh, has support for all sort, anything that has an API, as I said earlier. Uh, so very easy to kind of uh, consume that. So, and, and as, as we delve into, into, the, into the run of practitioners writing code to, to declare infrastructure, we should think about developer experience. So I think about excellent developer experience really is about simplifying that optimal solution without getting in the way, without being too magical, right? And so that's essentially uh, what we're trying to do. And this is a good example of something we've recently released, which is our cloud integration within uh, Terraform uh, Core, which is how do you use our Terraform Cloud uh, product uh, easily within Terraform? So we, we made that a very easy declarative uh, approach rather than the past, which uh, was actually uh, much harder to do. This is by default a very easy operation. And similarly, there's a lot of people who are application developers that they, you know, they want to uh, provision uh, infrastructure. And there's many cases where uh, HCL is not the right tool for them. And uh, so we have things like developers writing Ember code or uh, React code, JavaScript, uh, going back to the backend, doing Golang or Ruby and Rails or what have you. And in addition to that, going, going into learning uh, HCL to provision their infrastructure is a tall order. <laughs> so essentially, this is saying, stay within the context of the tooling that you already have. That's fine by us. Uh, use that language and still be able to provision their infrastructure and have that logic and that those patterns uh, applied to the to infrastructure as well. So that's what CDK is all about. 
Um, and recently, some of the exciting bits that we've added to, to HTL as a language, one is preconditions and post conditions. Uh, these enable the creation of custom rules um, for resource uh, data, for sources and outputs. And so the idea here is that a precondition will allow you to say, hey, uh, check, check this, run this check uh, right before the evaluating the associated objects. These are usually used for just making assumptions. Um, and similarly, a post condition is the same idea of just run this after uh, evaluating that object. So this is like where you want to you have certain guarantees. Uh, here you want to guarantee I'm, I'm provisioning an EC2, uh, you know, some kind of compute instance, and I want to make sure that it has accessible routes, uh, network routes, right? Um, and then another piece is refactoring IIC, really good example of developer experience. In the past, this would require, you know, manual state file surgery and understanding kind of really internals of Terraform. Today, we have a way to uh, declare kind of a, a refactoring of code to embrace kind of, you know, uh, other patterns around modules and uh, other uh, better approaches to, uh, to declare that infrastructure. And that's been hard, especially for users who've been using Terraform for a very long time. So we're, you know, looking at ways to improve that. And then finally, machine images. Um, this is the basis for, uh, for provisioning that infrastructure. And uh, the idea of a golden image is really fantastic and, and something that we haven't seen uh, kind of a really good workflow, multi-cloud workflow around. And the idea is an organization will have a common image, a base image, say a security team is going to add, you know, some of, some of the uh, uh, tooling that is required to, to, for the entire organization to be running. And then some other application team, say a billing project, uh, just to name one, might start with that base image and add their own application and data layer, and then based on that, deploy it. So now we have some guarantees that the base image is there for every image that is deployed in, in, in an organization. And the workflows around this on HTTP Packer, which is essentially a registry of these images, allow you to have visibility over images that are deployed, where are they deployed, and also allow you to have some control over those images. So for instance, here we have an example of uh, where um, an image is being revoked. So I, we don't want this image to be out in the world anymore, right? And so it's being revoked right there from the HTTP Packer UI. Um, there's a talk uh, about HTTP Packer that you should look at uh, by um, engineering and product leads in that team, Jordan and Alina, so check that out. Um, and one of my favorite parts is this tower from integration back to the developer experience, bit, experience bits. Um, in the past, you want to update the image that is run uh, from within Terraform. That would require changes in Terraform. Here, we're now saying, no, just point at HTTP Packer and control that from HTTP Packer itself. So really, really wonderful uh, way to do that. And then we have the extensible system. It's really about the ecosystem. We have over 2,200 providers today. These are all uh, cloud providers, SaaS systems, anything with an, with an API you can automate using Terraform. And really when I think about ex extensibility, it's about promoting innovation and enabling use cases that we haven't even thought of yet. Uh, in fact, future things that we that don't exist yet uh, is resilient to that, right? And so, one really powerful and uh, exciting uh, area of extensibility is run tasks, which allow you to control um, the flow uh, of a Terraform golden workflow uh, by hitting or calling back to to any system, whether it's a third-party system or one that you own, that you write yourself, uh, which is actually quite easy to write. So here, the example is between a plan and apply or a post and apply, our system is going to issue an HTTP post uh, request into the system of your choice. And you can respond in a way that blocks that execution from happening. So now you can have all sorts of use cases around, for example, security, or you could have cost estimation or cost governance, right? Uh, and many, many more, right? We already have over a dozen um, run task integrations, uh, something that launched you know, just weeks ago. Uh, so we're very excited about the ecosystem that's being built around run tasks and can't wait to see all the things that you can do with it. Um, briefly, how this shows up in our UI is uh, you know, in, in, injected into the, into the plan UI uh, or, or a plan of, of the run UI where you can see uh, which, which run tasks pass or fail. Right. 
Um, and then finally, the final bit is lifecycle management. So again, by having this easy way to provision infrastructure, multi-cloud environments, hybrid environments, that's amazing. We've, you know, we've, we're reaching that point where that's actually pretty well solved, um, but we've created new problems. Now, how do we make sense of that infrastructure? How do we, how do we provide visibility into it and how do we manage it? One easy example or one common example of something that happens in the life cycle of uh, resources and infrastructure in these multi-cloud environments is infrastructure drift. Whenever someone deviates from the golden workflow, this results in drift and drift is an issue. Uh, you know, we always want to know if uh, and pff, uh, any resource that we created went away. What if it went? Why did it go away? Right. And usually this happens in situations like emergency situations, like an incident occurs and you, you might want to allow certain folks to, you know, deal with the incident in real time and just go straight to the UI and the, and the cloud provider and do whatever changes they need to do to resolve that. Uh, oftentimes this happens because APIs are deprecated or sunset and change uh, and this can cause drift. But whatever the case is, we need to know about it. And so I'm really excited uh, to introduce drift detection into Terraform Cloud itself. Uh, this will be available uh, to all Terraform Cloud business uh, customers in the coming weeks. Uh, and um, it's built, built right in. And so the idea is we're provisioning infrastructure and we're now running a loop, a check, detect, and ultimately notify loop. Uh, and through that notification, this could be a webhook or it could be uh, email or Slack or any of the notifications uh, that we currently support for many of our, of our systems. And ultimately, you can do some remediation on that. Maybe the remediation is, I'm okay, leave it alone, uh, update our Terraform config, or maybe the, the remediation is rerun the apply. Some of the automation around that you could do through that webhook. And so this is really exciting because this framework and this structure can be used for many other pieces. Uh, for, for instance, before we talked about pre and post conditions, uh, this idea of having conditions that we guarantee or assume about our, uh, about our infrastructure, should, we should be able to check on that uh, continuously the way we're talking about here. So more to come on that, keep, uh, keep an eye out for that. So essentially, this was uh, what's exciting us uh, and some of the updates on Terraform and Packer. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, to, to HashiConf, uh, HashiConf Virtual. Um, and I look forward to you know, chatting with you on Twitter or uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, at that email address and um, goodbye.